Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Townsend Public Keynote Lecture. My name is Kareem Jaffer. I'm the Public Events Coordinator for the RASC Montreal Centre, as well as the Astronomy Prof here at John Abbott College. And I'd like to welcome you all to John Abbott, as well as to the RASC Montreal. And thankfully, we are back in person for a Townsend Public Lecture. We've gone three straight years online with the Townsend, so it's um, wonderful to be back here to be able to have a reception with our friends, our students, and our keynote speaker, and get a chance to actually just do some astronomy together. And hopefully later tonight, we will be on the field to enjoy a little bit of the moon and the planets. Now, if this lets me, and of course it doesn't, because that's the way in which technology always works. I wanna start with a land and sky acknowledgement. And I want to recognize that not only are we on unceded territory, but today is the day of truth and reconciliation with our First Nations people. So at the RAC Montreal Center for the last few years, we have been trying to acknowledge some of the star stories and some of the history that's in the sky and in our observations. And often the best place to see it is actually in the pictures of the moon and the way we call the moon at different times of the year. So at the moment, we are nearing a full moon phase. It was last night or tonight or early this morning, if you look at the actual exact time. And our full moon that we are at is called by the Mi'kmaq, the mate calling moon. So let's hear how we would pronounce that if we had an understanding of the Mi'kmaq language. So Wigumke Wigus is how we would call the mate calling moon. And it's important to recognize that the mate calling moon is called by the settlers, the harvest moon, because at this time of the year, nearest the equinox, the full moon actually lasts for a little bit longer in the night for more consecutive nights. For most of the year, the rise and set of the moon changes by about 50 minutes. But around the equinox, because our length of daylight and length of night changes much more gradually at those moments, it actually only changes by 20 minutes. Like farmers that much more extra light going from daytime into the full moon nighttime in order to pull out their harvest before the coming fall. It's also because it's the day of truth and reconciliation, we recognize the every child's matters as well as the way in which we see the First Nations here in the Quebec area. So I'm just going to restart the sharing because I don't think that the sharing had included the sound. And I want to make sure we can all hear the sound for the next part. When we started doing this, we wanted to get as much authentic voice as we could in how we recognize and appreciate the First Nations here in Quebec. And this video came out from the Quebec government last year, and we've incorporated it into some of our outreach. So I want to play for you this beautiful video from the First Nations children. Expressing identity and territory. Each sharing our strength and our story. We carry seasons, gestures, and culture for today and for our future. We are 11 nations, 11 ways of living here. Wendat, Iyo, Kanyagahaga, Mi'ma, Abeniki. Where else are we? Now you see us, and that's a start. So now we are also very privileged at the RASC Montreal Center that since COVID, we've been able to be joined for all of our public events by our honorary president, David Levy. Dovid is in Arizona and is joining us to give a welcome and a poetry reading or recital for our evening. Dovid, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kareem. Uh, as usual, I lost the link at the last minute, but even at the last, last minute, I was able to find it, and here I am. It's so good to be a part, and I'm, I have to tell you that I'm a part, I am a part of many astronomy organizations throughout mm -hmm. the world. In fact, I do one, typically one a day, 
But I can tell you all now that my very favorite one is the Montreal Center. I've been a member of it since 1964. And in those days, you couldn't be a member until you were 16. My first visit was October the 8th, 1960. And I walked in and there was Isabel Williamson who right away wanted me to start the um, lunar training program, which I did finish that just after I became a member in 1964. My poem today is going to be dedicated to Wendy's memory and is called Wendy Amongst the Stars. Each day I awake, today is the day. I look towards her, but she is not there. My heart goes on, but do I care? Will anything, anything let in a ray? The night is dark, as dark as coal. The sky is stars from east to west, from south to north, just like a feast, a pill, heaven sent to calm my soul. A telescope stands, stands and waits for my eye, it asks, just one brief look, forward through space like an open book, and backward through time, open wide its gate. I see a star. Why is it there? Lapis philosophorum. Philosopher's stone that strikes the night. It ushers me home as part of a pattern to learn, I dare. But reason not. General relativity, gravity's geometry, no speck of thought, no idea works, no system bought, a newborn thought of creativity. And the final stanza. Wendy, she's a part of me, a beam of light amongst the stars. In the sky, a star, not there, but there, her soul so far, from grief to joy, all through the night. Thank you, Kareem, and back to you. Thank you so much, Dovid. Thank you. <laughs> and I will put a little plug in. If you enjoyed hearing Dovid's poetry and his readings and a bit of the history, of astronomy here in Canada. You can catch Dovid almost every Tuesday night on the Explore Scientific Global Star Parties. He leads them off with a reflection or a reading or a quote for the night. And he's often involved in a lot of the really deep discussions in the 15 minutes leading up to the start of any of those global star parties, right Dovid? Absolutely, and I also go to most of the Wednesday night the Wednesday night uh, informal meetings. So you can see me there as well. And I noticed that Bob Ballant, Robert Ballantyne is here. Hi, Bob. Hi, Robert. It's good to see you. Wonderful. Uh, so we're going to now move into a little bit for those of you that are new to what we do here at the RASC Montreal Center. How many of you are joining a RASC Montreal Center event for the first time? I'm going to call on our Vice President, Maury Portnoff, to talk to you a little bit about what the RASC Montreal Center is. Okay, hey, uh, to advance it, which one? It's the down button there. The down. This one here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, welcome to uh, the Townsend Lecture. As mentioned, my name is Maury. I'm the Vice President. Um, first of all, if you have a cell phone, please turn it to off, vibrate, or mute, or airplane mode, just so we're not disturbed. And... Um, the Montreal Centre is one of many centres of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, located throughout Canada. So we're the Montreal Centre, we're the English Centre, there's a Francophone Centre also. We're one of the most active centres in all of Canada. Since COVID struck, as bad as it was, it, we rose to the occasion, literally. We were active at least two, three times a week, if not more. Our membership has grown to an all-time high. And because of Zoom, we took full advantage of it. We had speakers from all over the world. We've done cold meetings with a group in New Zealand, which went on for hours and hours. With, and we have new members now from all over the world. So we've really blossomed in a very uh, scary and sad time in, in our history, but we've managed to persevere and we're still growing. Um, with, we have our observatory out in the Arboretum, which is just on the other side. And what we have there is a 14 inch telescope and a 
in the, what we call the Bellevue Observatory. We also have a very strong relationship with John Abbott College and McGill. That's why we're here. We're fortunate through John Abbott College and Karim, who's a professor here. Um, we have a library. We always had a library, but it was a very old room. And John Abbott did a lot of renovations. And through Karim's uh, perseverance in negotiating with them, we got an incredible space in um, Hochelaga, where we have the Isabel Williamson Library, which is also used not just by us, but the students of John Abbott, which is great. So that we're really part of the John Abbott community, which really helps us. Um, so we have a lot of students who lend some youth to our membership. Otherwise, you just got a bunch of old guys like me hanging out, which is not very exciting, trust me. <laughs> and they also get really involved. They're held. In fact, we've got to thank them for if you were at the reception we had earlier, they were there instrumentally uh, setting it up. Um, come Halloween, they're going to be putting on what we call Spooky Nights, uh, which is a great event for the kids. Um, and it's a real hit. So it's going on to a, this is the third year or fourth year. I Seven don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is. But in the past, it was a really boring event where we didn't even have kids. And Halloween is for kids. So it's a fantastic event. Um, we also have a dark sky site in the South Shore near the U.S. border. We call it Woolly Woods because it's on a farm and there's there's uh, sheep and goats there. They're friendly, don't normally bother you. Um, but it's a really dark sky. It's fantastic. We were there a few nights, weeks ago, and you can actually see the Milky Way without a telescope when the conditions are great. The only downside there, like the Arboretum, is mosquitoes. They'll kill you every time. But we're going into a good time of year where it gets dark early and unfortunately it gets cold, but there's no mosquitoes. So we're in a wind situation until it gets too cold. We also use uh, a park out in Hudson off island called Thompson Park, which is a little better than on island. The Arboretum is the darkest skies in the, on the island of Montreal, so it's very good, but it's still not great. But once you get into Tom, into St. Lazar or Hudson, it's better. And when you get to the South Shore, or St. Chrysostone, it is much, it's amazing. Um, for beginners, actually, I will say Thompson Park is the best option of the two because at Woolly Woods, it's beautiful, but it's information overload. Eventually you can't make anything unless you're a real, you know, experienced observer. But that's the nice thing about our group is that the experienced observers and seasoned ones love to share with the beginners. So if you're a beginner, you're not made to feel like you don't know anything. Nobody's gonna say, read the manual and disappear. Everybody loves to share their scopes and help you observe and just enjoy the night sky. That's what we're about, enjoying the night sky. Um, okay, right. So the observatory in Bellevue Observer, you have a 14 years. Me, Woolly Woods, we have a 16 inch. Um, and we also have a 14 inch, I believe, there now. Um, we have observing events, clubhouses um, on, at the Wednesday nights, if there's observing. On Saturday nights, it's either observing or if the weather's bad, we have an informal clubhouse. So there's always a, there's a lot of socializing with our club. So we, we don't let the weather you know, keep us away. We have a library where members can take out books. If you remember, we do have one or two scopes that you can borrow if they're available. So you don't need a scope. You don't have to go and buy a scope right away. There's no need for that. Um, so you can borrow it. We have a fantastic newsletter called Skyward, which is rivals the former magazine Sky News, which is no longer in existence. And we have some old copies here that you can exactly. feel free to pick up. And we have outreach events with different groups, libraries, schools, cities. So very active in the community. Here we have an information table. We have old spot, some former sky news are about to be collector items. So keep them in good condition. Um, some information about upcoming events. You, you might have heard that there's a, a kind of an exciting event coming up, a, a solar eclipse. We have information on that. We have star finders, moon charts. So help yourself to any of this stuff. We wish to leave a few pennies, well, dollars better to help us out. 
Oh, doesn't work. Okay, so now we'll pass it over to to Russell, who's yeah. our outreach exec, who's going to talk to you about a really interesting program that we have with a deadline for tomorrow. If you're interested, yep. yeah. good luck with that. We'll even use that. Good move. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name's Russ, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, coordinating something called Introduction to Astronomy. So if you're new and you're curious and you want to find out all the basics, things like how to find your way around the sky, where's north. What's that shiny thing up on the horizon? Can you identify it yourself? You don't need an app. You don't need batteries. You don't need a cell phone. We'll show you how to find your way around all by yourself. Very, very cool. My daughter never gets lost at night anymore. She wants to find her way around the night sky. She's so cute. What about constellations? Maybe you heard of like the, the Big Dipper, there's an asterism, lots of things. There's lots of fascinating stuff out there. We can help you find your way around. Uh, also about the choice of equipment, you need to plunge in and buy a telescope right now and spend thousands of dollars. No, we'll show you all the things that you need. You already have it at home already. You just don't know it. We'll show you how. And finally, uh, some online tools, some really interesting things. Technology is great. Really makes the entry into astronomy really easy, really fast. So if you're interested in that, we're offering here at John Abbott College a series of six evening classes with exercises and if it's clear out we'll go out and look at the stars and we'll show try out what you've been learning so if you're interested we have a sign up here we have information um, we already have space is quite limited we have a few spots left if you're interested come and see me after the talk uh, the, the price is if you remember it's thirty dollars for all six lectures if you're a non-member trying it out well we need a little bit more so we ask for sixty dollars you want to bring your kids, they're certainly welcome, provided you come, uh, ten dollars a piece. So it's gonna be really cool. Starts two weeks from this Monday, right here at John Abbott College. Hope to see you there. I'll be giving you the first one. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Maury. Couple quick notes. First off, this is a this is a class run by the RASC Montreal Center. It's hosted at John Abbott, but a couple of people asked me. There is a chance that uh, there might be some strike work uh, happening by the teachers and the staff at the CEGEP in Quebec. If that happens, the venue will simply be moved because this isn't being run by John Abbott. It's just being run at John Abbott by the RASC Montreal Center. And the other thing to take note of is Russell's not offering to babysit your kids for $10 a, a head. Um, I don't know about, you know, whether he would ask you to babysit his kid for $10, a head, but he'll, he'll let you know about that. She's too old now. She's too old now. So as Maury mentioned, we run public events and we run on average one public event per month minimum throughout the year. And those are run either on Zoom or in person here or at the Morgan Arboretum. October is special because October actually has three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back public events coming up, starting with our partial solar eclipse event that will be here at John Abbott College on the Oval, regardless of weather. If the weather is good, we will be outside. We will get to see the partial eclipse with solar telescopes safely. If the weather is not good, we will still have a live stream inside of this annular eclipse passing through the U.S., and there will still be the space club inside to provide with you with some information, as well as the RASC members as well. After that, the following weekend on Saturday, October 21st, we have International Observe the Moon Night. And that's going to be at the Morgan Arboretum, where we get to see the first quarter moon. Again, regardless of weather. If the weather is great, we'll have a short talk inside, and then we'll be out on the field for the rest of the night. If the weather is poor, then we'll have two things inside in the conservation center there to help you learn more about the moon. And Nicole, our members liaison, myself and Russell are going to be running that evening. And then on October 27th, our students are running spooky nights here at John Abbott from 6.30 to 8.30. That's a Friday, so it's a little bit easier for kids to come after school, dress up for Halloween, and not have it impact their weekend plans or the actual day of Halloween. So we encourage you to keep an eye on any of these. All of our public events are free, but we do always appreciate donations that help us to keep this sort of material out here and available to the public, as well as our outreach into schools. Now, tonight is our Townsend Lecture. So I want to give you just a little bit of context on what the Townsend Lecture is. The RASC has been around for more than 150 years. 
at the Montreal Center for more than 100 years. Originally, we were based out of McGill, and it was mostly academics, and so the idea was to provide a little bit of a glimpse to the public of what the academics do on the research side. We had trouble as a society back in the mid early 1900s trying to subsist and trying to survive in that type of a climate where there really wasn't a big push for science. And so in 1950s, uh, one of our longtime members, uh, J. Early Townsend, he passed away and he bequeathed to us both some observing equipment as well as a small fund to try to bring a little bit of extra into the Montreal Center. And so in around 1956, we led off a series of public lectures that have been interrupted a couple of times, but we've resumed them with, with Panache over the last bunch of years. And these public lectures started with Harlow Shapey, who was one of the scientists who helped to determine the shape and the size of the Milky Way galaxy. We've had some incredibly renowned speakers and we're lucky to continue that tradition. Over the last few years, we had for our centennial year, the project manager for the radar sat constellation satellites from MDA and the CSA. We had the outreach scientists for the James Webb Space Telescope right before it came out. And then in 2020, we had to move online. However, we kept going with our public events. Every month we had public events and our Townsend speaker was still somebody chosen to bring the joy of not just astronomy and space, but also space exploration to the public here in Montreal. So we started in 2020 with Jason Rowe from Bishop's University, who's an exoplanet researcher and the NSERC chair for exoplanet research at Bishop's, followed by Elizabeth Howell, who is a science communication specialist. And she talked about a Mars exhibition, or Mars analog that she went to and how she wrote about it, and what the sort of experience is for going on analog missions. And then last year, we had one of our own, Emily LaFleche, who had gone on an analog mission and commanded the mission in Poland to study what it would be like to live on the moon. Emily is going to be giving a talk for us in January about all of her work since she got back from the moon. <laughs> and so we try our best with our Townsend lectures to bring a little bit of this joy of why we love not just astronomy, but also space exploration to the public in Montreal West Island and worldwide. We have people joining us on Zoom from all over the world and this event will be up on our YouTube channel afterwards. So for tonight, we are very lucky to have with us one of the renowned researchers in interstellar propulsion here in Canada, Dr. Andrew Higgins. Now, Andrew has been studying this field for over 30 years for propulsion research in mechanical engineering. Andrew recently, I think he developed this hyper-velocity -launch, hyper launch model for projectiles as well. But most recently this summer, he was actually the host for the International Symposium on Space Travel and Interstellar Propulsion here in the Montreal area. He has been going around to different SAGEPs to give talks about this field, but also a better idea of what the limitations are and why it's so tough for us to picture going outside of the solar system. So we're really honored to have with us tonight, Andrew. So Andrew, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Karim, for the uh, introduction. And it's a real honor to be here at such, a, such an august institution. I'm really honored. Uh, I am not an astronomer, but I should make clear I, I am an astronomy enthusiast. And my enthusiasm for astronomy goes, goes way back. So uh, this is a picture of me when I was 16 years old in 1986. Uh, I got excited, uh, particularly with the return of Comet Halley that year, which ended up being a little bit of a disappointment, at least for those of us in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, actually, I thought about maybe astronomy might have been a, a, a career for me. I was that enthused about it. But I also like to work a little bit with my hands and thought about, could we build machines that could get to the stars? Uh, around that same time, 1985, 86, I read a book that greatly influenced me. It was called Flight of the Dragonfly by Robert L. Forward. It's a science fiction novel. And in that book, uh, Robert L. Forward proposed a way to get to the stars. He actually proposed to send a crew to Bernard Star, which at the time there was still thought might have a, might have an exoplanet orbiting it. 
And his concept was to build a giant laser, enormous laser, hundreds of gigawatts of power. In the book, they build it at Mercury. They convert Mercury into solar arrays to power the, the laser. And then you shine that laser onto a giant lens that would be thousands of kilometers in diameter. It's a Fresnel lens. And that would focus the laser light onto a light sail, thin membrane, again, a thousand kilometers in diameter. And the laser would push that sail up to 20 or 30% the speed of light. And he even worked out a mechanism to decelerate the sail. Uh, and Forward knew quite a bit about lasers. He was at the uh, Hughes Research Center where the laser was invented in 1960. His first uh, paper is about uh, uh, using a laser for interstellar travel written in 1962, just two years after the laser was invented. And he didn't just write science fiction. He also published scientific papers uh, that filled in the engineering details behind his uh, science fiction novels. So just how hard is this? So um, I'm a big fan of scale models of the solar system. And every time I'm in uh, Boulder, Colorado, I like to visit the one that's on the UC Boulder campus. There is a gold sphere about the size of a grapefruit, plump la mousse, in the middle of the campus. Uh, and that represents the sun. And you walk a few feet away and there's a little pedestal. There's a tiny speck on it, that's Mercury. A few more feet, Venus, a few more feet. And there's a tiny little BB. Uh, that represents the Earth. And you look back and you say, is that really how small the sun is? But then you look up in the sky and realize, yes, the proportions are correct. So you have to walk all the way across campus to get to the edge of the solar system. And I thought I'd try to map this onto our campus uh, here at, at Abbott. So if this is the sun right in the center, again, a grapefruit, right in the center of the circle drive, where is the edge of the solar system now defined as Neptune? Where do you think that would be? I take a guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just about where the where the 20 is. Okay, so it'll probably take us five, eight minutes to walk there. That would be the orbit of Neptune. Okay. Again, grapefruit pomplamus in the center of campus. The furthest spacecraft we have launched away from the Earth is Voyager 1, launched in 1977. Uh, we just passed the anniversary of its launch a couple weeks ago. It has made it out now 140 astronomical units, which puts it right about off the edge of my plot here. So we've made it past uh, Smoke Meat Pete, which <laughs> for some reason Google Maps this afternoon would not let me generate a map without identifying that landmark for some reason. So this is this is as far as as a human product a, a machine has has reached. Quite a magnificent machine. On this scale, how far do we have to go to get to Proxima Centauri? <laughs> Toronto, a little bit further. Florida, Edmonton, further, further. Okay, not quite that far. Okay, so here's Voyager 1. To get to Proxima Centauri, we have to go all the way to Victoria. Okay, we have to go all the way across Canada. So it's taken us almost 50 years to get to Smoke Meat Pete, okay, to get, uh, it's about 1.4 kilometers from here. So if that took us 50 years, how long is it gonna take us to get to Proxima Centauri? It's gonna be tens of thousands of years. So if you send a probe to an exoplanet on human time scales, we're gonna to have to go tens of thousands of times faster. So forget about rockets, okay, all my knowledge as a, as a professor of aerospace engineering, I put into a box and leave on a shelf when I think about the interstellar challenge. This is gonna require totally different types of technologies. But as Forward showed, as difficult as this is, it's just about the most difficult thing we can imagine doing, but it's not impossible, okay? If we've made it to, you know, uh, Il Perro, is it really inconceivable to think about going on all the way to, to Victoria and Vancouver Island. What are we gonna get when we fight? When, what are we gonna find when we get there? Well, artists make renderings of what we think exoplanets look like. Every week now in the news, new exoplanet discovery made, very exciting time for astronomers. And artists make renderings of what, what they think it might look like. Let's look at the renderings of what artists thought our solar system would look like. So, uh, what, what, what did people think Io looked like or Titan looked like? They sketched something that looks like a moon, 
uh, our moon, a very smudgy rendering of Jupiter. Uh, Titan looks a bit like our moon with some ice on it. But what did we find when we went there with Voyager and Galileo? We found you know, Io, active volcanoes. The surface of Io changes so frequently, you would need a geographic map that changes on the time scale of our weather maps to understand Io. We get to Titan, we find an active hydrosphere, not water, but liquid hydrocarbons changing the surface of Titan, okay? We found that each one of these gas giants, like a little solar system, all to itself. What did we think Triton would look like? The moon of Neptune, again, moon with some snow on it. But we found instead an active world, again, cryovolcanoes. Pluto, this is the famous stamp that inspired Alan Stern and others to mount a mission to Pluto. Looks like sort of a salmon colored Earth moon again, right? What did we find again? Incredibly active world, glaciers flowing on the surface of Pluto. So think about this when you see renderings of what artists think exoplanets might be like. Look at these examples and we know exoplanets are gonna be incredibly bizarre, different than anything we might've perceived. And what would it be like to look at these things for the first time? So I just love these uh, images. I'm old enough to remember a little bit of Jupiter and Saturn, but I remember very well the Uranus and Neptune encounters. I was in high school and university and just the excitement of these scientists when these first images came back. You know, one of my heroes, Carolyn Porco here, who was uh, imaging on, on Voyager and Cassini, okay. Well, I say something a little controversial. I'm, I'm getting a little bored with our solar system. Okay, so, so do, are, are we sure we should have invited this guy if he's bored with our solar system? But what are we visiting lately? You know, recently we've had two spacecraft visit two asteroids. Uh, we've had uh, Hayabusa visit Roigu, and we had Osiris Vex uh, visit Bennu. Can you tell me which one's which? Which one's Bennu? There's some people pointing on the right, left. The people that said left were correct, okay? But what if all the asteroids end up looking like this, okay? Uh, I can still get my pulse up, right? This, next week, we're gonna launch the, the, the mission to uh, Psyche, you know, which is an all metal, potentially uh, core of a, of a planetesimal. That, that could be something new, something exciting. But I wanna get back to these jaw-dropping moments of seeing worlds that we just, never even imagined could be as bizarre as, as Io. Well, there's worlds out there, they're exoplanets. And we're living in this incredibly exciting time for astronomers, not for aerospace engineers, but for astronomers. Uh, we just passed 5,500. Uh, this is the latest plot that JPL generated earlier this week. And, you know, enormously exciting time, but I wanna make something clear is all astronomers will ever give us is this. Okay, can you see that? That's a single pixel. So when you hear exoplanet astronomers talk about imaging an exoplanet, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about getting a single pixel. Even with the biggest telescopes we have ever imagined building, the extremely large telescopes in, 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 in Chile, this is all astronomers will ever be able to get is a pixel. Now again, total respect, total props to astronomers. They're very, very smart and they can learn an awful lot from a pixel. So they can take the light of that pixel, pass it through a you know, diffraction grading, get spectra and make amazing discoveries like just a couple of weeks ago, they announced with Kepler uh, K218b evidence of methane carbon dioxide uh, in, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. So very exciting. But I have a feeling that there's always gonna be controversy about what we see with that pixel. And I'll, I'll just give you a little uh, example that you may know about. So uh, phosphine is often has now been identified uh, by some very smart people as being probably the strongest indicator of life. Okay, it's a molecule that's very, very hard to make. If you find phosphine, it almost has to be made by life. And so a lot of the exoplanet community is now looking for this Impatient for photons, they decided to look a few years ago at Venus. And about three years ago, in September 2020, uh, some very bright people, including Sarah Seeger at MIT, announced evidence that they had found phosphine in the, ap in the atmosphere of Venus using spectroscopy. But this was greeted with a lot of skepticism. 
Okay, and it's still debated today. And I don't think that debate is likely to be resolved until we go to Venus and sample the atmosphere. Okay, and there's a lot of missions uh, uh, being planned now to do exactly that. And Venus gives us all the photons we want, right? You people know that on a good night, you know, Venus is so bright, it almost hurts to look at it, right? So when you get all the photons you want from that pixel, it's still not clear if it's, if it's life or not. So I'm arguing tonight that we're gonna have to go there. Uh, and this is very, very difficult to do. And this is what we're now working on at, at McGill. Uh, I'm gonna make clear that there's a big fork in the road when you start thinking about how we might get to the stars. One path is to think about novel physics, warp drives, wormholes, breakthroughs, or alternative interpretations of physics, something like the Mach effect thruster. I'm not gonna talk about these because I am not a physicist and I'm not qualified, although I do, I'm in sort of the same community as researchers that work on this. So if you wanna talk about this, I can't answer your questions, but I can be happy to put you in contact with people that work on these. So as an engineer, I limit myself to the, to the physics that's found in our CJEP and you know, first year university textbooks. That's the books I have on my shelf. Uh, and there's quite a few different approaches, okay? Uh, tonight, plan A is gonna be the laser light sail, but some mornings I wake up and I'm pretty keen on antimatter rockets or beaming energy to your spacecraft. But you'll notice there's not even ion drives or fission rockets or even fusion rockets. They just don't make the cut if you wanna get a mission to a star in a human lifetime. So I'm gonna to focus tonight on the laser light cell. If you're intrigued by these other ones, I'll be happy to talk about them in the, in the questions and answers. So yes, we need a really big laser. We're gonna go back to Robert O. Forward's idea of building a giant laser and putting that the, the momentum of those photons onto a very, very thin sail and accelerating it up to not really relativistic speeds. We're not gonna to get to speeds where relativistic mass increase becomes significant. We're gonna get the 20 or 30% the speed of light. But I, I'm gonna to try to convince you this is something that's gonna happen much sooner than even a very forward thinking individual like Robert Forward thought would happen. I think this is gonna happen in our lifetimes and maybe not my lifetime. Okay, I'm going to the gym, I'm taking my omega-3, <laughs> I wanna be there but there's a lot of young people in the audience tonight that I think is, is gonna have an excellent chance to see this happen. Because there's been four developments in the last 20 years that people like aerospace engineers haven't really paid attention to that may enable entirely new means of propulsion. So one of them is the revolution in photonics. Those of you that are watching this online tonight, you're watching me very likely through a fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cables, uh, you know, lasers are beamed down those, those fiber optic cables. And photonic engineers have now figured out how to make lasers out of fiber optics. So this is the kind of lasers that are used now for telecommunication, for laser welding, for laser processing. And the actual laser cavity itself is made out of a fiber optic cable. And over the last 20 years, these things have gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more and more powerful, very much like Moore's law. You know, the idea that every 18 months, computer chips get twice as powerful uh, or, or half as cheap. The same thing has happened with these fiber optic lasers. And what can you do with these fiber optic lasers is you can combine them together in a phased array, which I'll show you in a minute. The next thing is we now have materials that can withstand enormous laser flux. So Robert O. Forward's idea was to make the sail out of, of metal, thin aluminum, okay? but even the most shiny aluminum mirror uh, absorbs about 5% of the radiation on it. And that limits how powerful the laser flux can be, how fast, how great the acceleration of the sail can be. But again, because of the photonic revolution, we now have materials that uh, have very low absorptivity of glass and you can combine them together in something called a Bragg mirror, dielectric mirror that can make them highly reflective. So this is the mirror from the LIGO observatory which is 99.99995% reflective, okay? And it only absorbs parts per billion of the laser flux on them. So you can put very, very intense laser on them and not vaporize the sail. The next thing I don't need to tell you much about is the just incredible miniaturization of electronics, which uh, billions of dollars of R&D have gone into to make these, you know, these gadgets that we all can't live without now but it's, it's just really staggering to think about what these, uh, what these devices can do. So when I went to 
My undergraduate university, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, was very excited. The first day I got on campus, I went to the astronomy building, went to the seventh floor, looked through a window into a machine room and saw a Cray supercomputer, which is the most powerful computer on the planet in 1987, could do 500 million floating point operations per second. Okay, 500 MFLOPs. Today, 500 MFLOPs is an iPhone 5. Okay, it's an iPhone that's so crummy, you can't even sell it on Craigslist, right? You, you know. This is what the spacecraft will look like. It'll be a little chip, okay? That little chip has more computing power than existed in the whole world uh, 30 years ago. And when we build supercomputers now, the way we build them is we get chips that are from graphics cards and stack them together. This is our supercomputer at, at McGill University. It's actually housed at ETS. Uh, and it's just NVIDIA graphics cards stacked up together, okay? And this is how we've learned to exploit technology that has gotten very, very cheap because of the billions of dollars of R&D that have gone into smartphones and photonic communications. So this is sort of what this spacecraft and the sail itself will look like. So think of the light sail and the spacecraft as being a single integrated thing. What will take the pictures of the exoplanet, this is a camera, this exists, okay? That picture was taken with that camera, okay? And that will be integrated into the sail as well. And finally, something from the astronomy community is adaptive optics. So this is a picture of Neptune taken from an observatory in, in, uh, in, in, in Chile, uh, very blurry because we live in the bottom of an ocean, the atmosphere of the earth, which is turbulent. But with one click of the mouse, they can, adapt, they can enable adaptive optics. So the mirror is distorted in real time to remove the turbulence of the atmosphere. And the images you can get now from Earth-based telescopes are actually better than the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so the astronomers can essentially remove the Earth's atmosphere. And we can use that effect in reverse to base the laser we need on the ground. So again, Robert R. Forward, others thought, well, we need to build this laser in space. We would need to master the resources of the entire solar system to, to build the laser. But if we can build the laser on the ground, we can build it cheap, we can use unskilled labor to, to build this enormous laser, which I'm going to show you in a moment, okay? And we use the same algorithm in reverse. We distort the laser beam so that as it passes through the turbulent atmosphere, it comes out a perfectly collimated beam, okay? So what would this look like? Uh, this is, I think you know what this is. This is a, a, a solar thermal uh, power plant. So these are, these are just mirrors that focus the light onto the tower. But uh, I just show you this to give you kind of a feel for the scale, the kind of engineering that would need to be done. This is about a kilometer in diameter. The laser would need to be much bigger than that. The laser would need to be about 10 kilometers in diameter, but it would look visually something like this, only rather than mirrors, these would be those fiber optic lasers all hooked together in a giant phased array. So all the light waves leaving are, 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 are in sync with each other, they're in phase. And then you can slightly shift the phase of one laser to the other, to make it act like a giant lens, like a perfect diffraction limited lens. Okay, even though there's no 10 kilometer diameter piece of glass. Okay, so this is sort of what this would look like. Again, it's not as big as South America. It's 10 kilometers in diameter, would likely be solar powered. So it would sit and collect power from the sun for a day, charge up batteries. And then it would reform that energy into an infrared laser. Okay, as it leaves the surface of the earth, it's about one kilowatt per square meter, which is about the flux of sunlight. So it's not that dangerous. You could actually walk through the laser beam. Okay, don't tell the McGill laser safety office that I recommend you do this, okay. <laughs> but uh, it, it would be safe to walk through the laser. Don't look down as you do it, okay. But if you take one kilowatt per square meter over 10 kilometers and now focus all that light onto a sail that's only a meter in diameter, it's a less than a micron thick. And remember the sail is the computer, is the camera, is the, the entire spacecraft. That sail will accelerate at about 50,000 Gs. After three minutes, it will be moving 30% the speed of light. So we only need to run that laser for about three minutes, okay? And then that's it, the laser is turned off. The sail will then turn and fly edge on and it will take it, you know, we're going uh, let's say 30% the speed of light and 
Proxima is four light years away. So that will take us, you know, 12, 15 years to get there. We have to wait another four years for the data to get back. How does the data get back? Well, there's a little one watt laser transmitter on the sail that will beam the data back. And this giant array can also act like a telescope and receive the data when it comes back. And you can actually stream HD quality video from that little one gram probe as it passes through a solar system, okay? And the next day we can launch another one to another exoplanet. And the next day, another one and another one, okay? So all this was put together by uh, uh, Philip Lubin, who's right here. He's a, he's a astronomer. He had worked on COBE and WMAP and the Planck satellites. He's a cosmic microwave background astronomer uh, by, by background. Uh, but he wrote all this up into a paper. You can get this online for free. Uh, it's hosted on a NASA website. Just type interstellar flight roadmap and, and into your favorite search engine and you will, you will find it. And there's nothing in that paper you can't understand as a high school or CJEP student. Uh, when I read this, I just kept you know, hitting myself. Why didn't I think of this, right? All this, this knowledge is out there. And this really energized the community. And in particular, it attracted the interest of Yuri Milner, who is a Silicon Valley billionaire, who announced the next year in 2016, uh, something called the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative. So this was a big event in Washington, in, in New York City. Uh, Stephen Hawking was still alive. He was present. Uh, this is Carl Sagan's widow. This is Zach Manchester, who has actually built one gram size spacecraft and flown them in low Earth orbit and shown that they work. Uh, Freeman Dyson was still alive. This is Mae Jemison, remarkable person, uh, the first African-American female astronaut. Uh, and she has her own foundation promoting interstellar flights. This is uh, former director of NASA Ames, uh, Pete Worden. Uh, this is Harvard astronomer Abby Loeb, who you might have heard about, has some interesting ideas about interstellar travel himself. So suddenly this became sort of a mainstream field. And I had sort of kept my interests uh, in this kind of in the closet for, for many decades to become a respected academic. But when this was announced, I said, okay, that's it. I'm gonna clear off everything else on my plates. All my current grad students, time to finish up your thesis. Uh, and I was coming up on a sabbatical and went and spent my sabbatical in 2018 with Philip Lubin's group, which is conveniently located in Santa Barbara, which is a nice place to spend your winter after spending uh, many winters here in Montreal. So yeah, I had a surfboard, but go out and, and surf every morning, go into campus and try to engage in this and found out very quickly that there's not a lot I can do to help uh, Philip Lubin's group in Santa Barbara. So everything they're doing is working on on the photonics of this, how to phase lock the lasers together, the, the PhDs and postdocs all have backgrounds in, in quantum optics. And this was beyond my, my humble uh, skill level as a aerospace engineer. But I also got to see what they weren't working on. And I think the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, the day they announced this initiative, they unveiled a website where they listed all the problems that need to be solved. And I can already detect there's some people in the audience here that are saying, wait a minute, I think, I think, I think there's a flaw in this plan. I think there's something that might go wrong with this, with this approach. So I look forward to hearing those and the questions and answers. Uh, but they were very open in saying there's a lot of problems we need to solve. And I spent a lot of time talking to Philip Lubin and his research group about the problems they're working on, about other problems. And when I saw there was something that they weren't working on that I might be able to contribute to, that helped formulate what we're working on now at McGill. So these are some of the problems that we're focusing on. One of them is the mechanical integrity of the sail. I'm in a department of mechanical engineering, so that's well suited to us. As Karim mentioned, I have a background in working on hypervelocity launchers. I worked on orbital debris impact in low Earth orbit. Uh, we have a lab at McGill where we can simulate impacts up to 10 kilometers a second, hypervelocity impacts. But what about hitting an interstellar dust grain, not at 10 kilometers a second, but it's 60,000 kilometers a second. Maybe some of my expertise can, can be of help here. So when I got back in 2019, we launched a group, uh, our, our experimental research group. I hope everybody got a sticker from our, from our research group, kind of our logo on it. And we got a lab with a lot of cool toys in it, high-speed cameras, shock tubes, hypervelocity guns. We have a kilowatt, three kilowatt laser now uh, that we can, we can work with to start on the bench top, testing out some of the technologies that are needed for interstellar flight. But the best thing we have, like you have here at John Abbott and 
at the other fine universities and CJEFs uh, here in Montreal. We have a lot of really smart people, okay, smarter than I am, that can help me work through the, the math and the equations that I'll show you here in a, in a moment. Uh, and I have been actually working a lot with the CJEFs, actually. Uh, Jana here uh, started working with me when she was at Vanier and then continued to collaborate, uh, work in my group when she came to McGill. So I'm actually very interested to work as well with people here at, at Abbott. So yeah, one of the problems is we want the sail to be nice and smooth and flat, but what if it starts to wrinkle or crinkle or get crumpled up, okay, when we hit it with 100 gigawatts of laser power? So this is one of the first problems that we worked on. It took us about three years to do this uh, uh, work. It's now published. And being an engineering professor, yes, I have to show you a little bit of free body diagrams and finite element methods and some scary equations. Okay, so we worked out a complete theory for the dynamics of this sail under laser loading. So it's all done with Lagrangian dynamics. So if you're studying physics, uh, you, you might recognize the Lagrangian up here in the, in the left. And the, the, the too long didn't read version of this paper is we proved that there's no material that can make that sail stiff enough. So even if you made the sail out of diamond, if it's only a micron thin, it's still gonna crumpled up when it hits the laser. But it turns out if you just spin it, at a few revolutions per minute, the centrifugal force is enough to hold it flat. Or you can use some kind of tensioning mechanism, maybe a little inflatable inner tube around the edge is enough to hold that seal flat. So that was one problem we contributed to. The other thing is, while I'm getting a little bored with that solar system, uh, not everybody is, and my students are pretty enthused about exploring the solar system. Uh, there's, there's some people out there with deep pockets that have an interest of going to live on or die on Mars. Uh, so one thing we're thinking about is what's a more near-term application of this laser? So before we build the 10 kilometer diameter laser that we're going to put onto the one meter, one meter interstellar light sail, we may want to put build a smaller laser and what can we do with that? So one thing we've been looking at is maybe a 10 meter diameter laser, which can laze out to about uh, 100,000 kilometer or 100,000 kilometers or so, uh, could be a way to deliver power to a spacecraft uh, to get around the solar system, or at least send it off uh, to destinations in the solar system. And one way you could do that is something called laser thermal propulsion. Uh, so you, you just basically take the laser, focus it with a big inflatable reflector, something like a parabolic mirror. It doesn't need to be nearly as precise as your parabolic mirrors. We just need to get the laser focused into a little heating chamber and it's basically a steam kettle. We're going to use hydrogen instead of water because we want low molecular weight for high specific impulse. Uh, but we can, with this, realize the kind of the holy grail of propulsion, which is high thrust and also high specific impulses, yeah, specific impulses that are actually better than nuclear thermal rockets. So during the pandemic, when we were all sitting at home in our pajamas and we couldn't get into our lab, uh, summer of 2020, we did a complete design of this spacecraft almost down to the nut and bolt level. We, we uh, broke up into teams and did structures, propulsion, thermal, optics, and uh, published a nice paper on, on the design of this vehicle, which looks like this. Again, big inflatable reflector. We put that into a heating chamber, take uh, hydrogen, and, and expand it just through a conventional, conventional nozzle. And this got a lot of attention when we published it. I'm, it's kind of a new experience for me. Usually as an academic, you publish a paper and if, if two or three people in the world read it and give you feedback, it's, it's, a, it's a really good day. If you're ever at an academic conference and you, you need a free lunch, just go up and tell a professor, I read your paper and they're very likely invite you out to lunch. But <laughs> this was quite, quite, a, quite an experience to be uh, uh, previewed all over the world uh, with, uh, with, the, with the interest around this, around this study that we did. So our work on this uh, led us to be invited to host the Interstellar Symposium, which Curry mentioned. So there is a community of people that study this. Uh, I was delighted to have my colleague Phil Lubin come to Montreal. Uh, so this was back in July. Uh, it was the week, well, a lot of weeks rained all week this summer. It was the week the tornado came down uh, mm -hmm. when everyone was trying to leave Montreal. So I don't know if we left a good impression on people, but yeah, we were just thrilled. My students and I, uh, didn't do a lot of research this last summer because we were dealing with caterers and AV logistics and so on. But yeah, we were really honored to have the entire world community of, of people that are working on, on different aspects of interstellar travel. 
and not just the hard engineering stuff. So we had philosophers, we had people that work in ethics. Uh, we had a really fascinating panel of uh, people that were talking about how would you select a crew for an, an eventual interstellar mission? How would we reflect the, the uh, and how would you do that? So how would you represent humanity on, a, on, a, on an interstellar mission? So uh, if you missed that meeting, I'm very uh, proud that we, we uh, have all the lectures and presentations now recorded. And the meeting, the, the sponsor of the meeting, so we were the local organizers, but the sponsor was something called the Interstellar Research Group, uh, which is based out of the United States. They've traditionally had this meeting at locations in the US. This is the first time it was held internationally. Uh, so if you can go on YouTube and type Interstellar Research Group, you'll find all of the presentations on there. And that is really a, a fantastic resource if you're interested in interstellar travel. All the videos there, a lot of this stuff has not made it into the journals yet. It's not always easy to publish this stuff in mainstream engineering journals because it raises some eyebrows. So there's a lot of excellent material on this YouTube channel that you're not going to find, find any place else. So if you're interested in this, uh, we need help, we need support. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, not a, not a spectator sport, we, we want people involved. And I just thought I would mention a few resources here. So one thing is there is a fantastic blog uh, that uh, is my, my home screen when I open up my browser called Centauri Dreams. And it's updated two or three times a week and it follows all the exciting developments, not just in exoplanets, but also in, uh, in, in this field of, of researchers in interstellar travel. So I, I really highly recommend that, uh, that blog. And then the, the main inter international organization that, that promotes interstellar flight research is the Interstellar Research Group, again, based in the US. And this is our group at McGill. We have a website and you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram with uh, McGill underscore at Astra. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up to questions. And for those that are online, if you type any questions in chat, we'll be sure to relay them as well to Dr. Higgins. Questions? Oh, um, okay, great. Yeah, great question. So uh, the acceleration is very, very difficult. There's, there's some ideas how we might do that, but the first mission I feel would almost certainly be a flyby mission. So our first probe to the moon was a flyby. Our first probes to Venus, Mars were flybys. Our first probe to Jupiter and Saturn, flybys. And the only spacecraft we've ever sent to Uranus, Neptune, and, and Pluto, all flybys. So I'm just thinking about that first mission, the flyby mission. There are some ideas how you might be able to decelerate. So one idea is you might be able to deploy a, a like superconducting loop of cable and try to break against the Interstellar magnetic field is one idea, uh, but it, it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult problem. Uh, and you might think, you know, gosh, flying through a, a solar system at thirty percent the speed of light, it's still going to take several hours. You know, the the little star chip is is certainly going to have artificial intelligence capability. And uh, there have been some studies done on this. Philip Lubin's group has written some papers on this, and it you know should should be able to do that, right? The new yeah, have you seen the new iPhone 15 camera, right? I mean, you can you can jog and 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 uh, have that camera running and it just makes these absolutely perfectly still uh, uh, movies. So if we can do that on an iPhone 15, I think in 20 or 30 years when we launch this mission, I think we'll have cameras uh, that are smart enough to be able to track an exoplanet as you fly by at, at 30% the speed of light. That's just what, what did Robert Ford say? Okay, yeah, I can tell you about his idea. So his idea was to launch a sail that has an even bigger sail as a ring around the outside. And halfway to your target, you detach that outer ring. It goes ahead because it's even lighter. It's not carrying any payload. And it reflects the laser back onto the sail. So in Forward's idea, the laser stayed on the whole way there. That's why he needed that giant 10,000 kilometer diameter Fresnel lens. Because his plan was to laze the whole way there, but to bring a crew. So you only accelerate it you know, 1G. So you don't squash your crew. Uh, and then you focus the laser onto the front of the sail. And then he even worked out a way to get back to Earth uh, in, in, his, in his books. So it's like uh, a reverse thruster on a plane. Yeah, yeah. So for those that are online, the initial question was about decelerating when you get to the uh, 
target uh, star or star system that you want to go to. And then the follow-up question was a little bit about the actual methodology of that type of deceleration if we get to that point. Next question, Lucas. Yeah, so given how long it takes, even at 30% of the speed of light to get to uh, our central tower, uh, would we send one light sail first uh, and wait for all the data to come back, or would we take a chance to build many and launch them successfully to maximize chances of success and also to improve data? So just to repeat the question, the question was, given the amount of time it takes with the light sail, even at 30% the speed of light, do we send one and wait for the data to come back, or do we create many and send them one at a time? Yeah, I think you would probably send a lot of them. I think you would kind of probably shotgun them because there is some challenges on the way, which I, I have a suspicion we're going to get a question about here in a minute. Um, but it's, uh, I think maybe a historical analog to this is uh, in, in World War II, they developed something called the proximity fuse. So when they were uh, developing anti-aircraft uh, during World War II, uh, they developed radar that could actually be mounted into an artillery shell and it would sense when it's near an enemy aircraft and, and explode uh, because it's very hard to hit it directly. And when they were developing that, initially only 1% or 5% of them would, would survive being shot out of a, out of a cannon and, 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 and survive. And the decision was made, if we can get to 50% reliability, it's probably worthwhile going ahead and, and, and deploying these. And this is, I think maybe the idea here is there's some hazards along the way and, uh, and maybe we just launch many, many of these probes uh, and, and hope that a few of them get through. But if you can launch one a day, you know, you can launch an awful lot of, a lot, awful lot of probes. Aaron. Um, thanks for the presentation. You had me up until the Lagrange equation, but I lost. <laughs> How much would it cost to build one of these probes? So the question is, how much would it cost to build one of these probes? It's not the probe; it's probably the laser. That's okay. the big, the big ticket item. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, this would be—I showed you that little loop of fiber optic. Okay, so these fiber optic lasers—I have one in my lab, actually. Uh, you know, they're right now a few thousand dollars to generate watts or kilowatts, but we need to generate gigawatts. So we would need, need, you know millions or tens of millions of these lasers. So it's really a question of, does that Moore's law scaling continue? You know, are we gonna keep seeing these lasers get cheaper and cheaper? And we, at the Interstellar Symposium this summer, we, we had some, some pretty knowledgeable people there. One of the, our guests was Professor Harry Atwater from Caltech, who's an expert in photonics. He, I think, holds the world record for the world's most efficient photovoltaic. And he's now been involved in this breakthrough star shot. And he was saying, even if these fiber optic lasers don't work out, there's other kinds of solid state lasers that are being developed that should scale even better. It's you know, kind of like how amazing solar photovoltaics have scaled. You know, 20 years ago, we were very skeptical if solar you know, would really scale. Could, as we start to mass produce photovoltaics, would they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper? And thankfully, they have. It's now the cheapest form of energy we have. So if the, the lasers can scale like that, then it gets to be... You know, it's going to be like on the order of the Large Hadron Collider, the International Space Station, to be a you know many many billion dollar project, and then the sale itself will probably be pretty cheap, if we can leverage all the advances being made in micro electronics and photonics and everything that goes into our into our smartphones. Not it. So given that the probe only to collect data and photos and the microphone light years away, what kind of energy storage development that we're looking for on board the sales side probe. So the question was regarding energy storage on board the probes because it's going to be requested to send back data uh, over four light years distance. Yeah, I don't need power. So probably a little tiny radioisotope battery, you know, a little, you know, the big little radioactive batteries that used to go in people's pacemakers. So imagine that technology, again, project forward 20 or 30 years, right? This, we're not gonna do this tomorrow. So that would probably be enough power. Uh, I think that the, the laser transmitter to send the data back, you know, again, it's a watt or 10 watts. So having a little radioactive power source would do it. Once you're in the, uh, the, the exoplanet solar system, you can probably use solar photovoltaics. Again, actually, there's a paper just published this week uh, called Interstellar Photovoltaics in uh, a prestigious journal you can find online. And they were exploring how we might optimize 
photovoltaic cells for use in other solar systems. So, you know, again, this is what's exciting. People are engaging these, these, these engineering problems for us. So we have an online question from Paul Simard, who's our president for RASP, but is sick at the moment, so wasn't able to join us. I assume we will not be trying to have these probes through the system to avoid a chance of impacts. What kind of images would we get depending on how close we get to the system? Okay, yeah, so this is what I was hoping somebody would ask about was uh, impacts. So yes, there's dust, okay. Uh, there's also just matter. There's hydrogen atoms floating around out there. Uh, those, we have a pretty good idea of what will happen. So we in the lab can, can take atoms, accelerate them up to MeV energies, you know, significant fraction of the speed of light, hit them on surfaces. And that's, we'll say it's called sputtering. And if you do that calculation, you're gonna erode away some of the material. So yes, everything will have to be redundant. You know, it'd be some kind of neural computer that's, that's like our brain's highly redundant so it can take that kind of damage. But the dust impacts are something I lose sleep about. Now this question's been raised, I'm gonna lose sleep over it tonight. <laughs> uh, and I think it might be one of the showstoppers that's, that's out there. So in anticipation of this, I did have some auxiliary slides. I can talk a bit about this. <laughs> uh, let me skip ahead. So the thing I really lose sleep about with the laser light sale is what happens, uh, well, let's talk about interstellar first. So you can do the calculations uh, about, we, we have a pretty good idea about how much dust is in interstellar media. If you're a real astronomer, it turns out, wow, there is a lot of literature out there on dust because it's, it's, it's a highly undesirable thing for astronomers, right? This is actually why Hubble got the Hubble constant wrong was because of the reddening of stars due to dust. So as a, as a non-astronomer to go read the literature on this, wow, there was a lot of stuff out there on, on, on interstellar dust. Uh, so this is what one square millimeter of a spacecraft looks like after it's traveled about a light year. Okay, and each one of those is gonna be a dust grain impact, okay? People are like, gosh, a dust grain going at 20% the speed of light, that's gonna be like an atomic bomb going off. No, it's about a joule of energy. So a dust grain impacting at the speeds we're gonna be going is, is like a joule of energy. That's like a starter pistol going off or a firecracker or a big capacitor going spark, going zap, okay? So you will have to shield against those. For the light sail, we would probably fly edge on through the interstellar media, maybe with some shielding on the leading edge, okay? Uh, what I am more concerned about is during those three minutes when the, when the laser is on and you're traveling through the solar system, there's a lot more dust in our solar system. And this is what one square centimeter of the light sail is gonna look like after it travels about a 10th of an AU. That's how long it's gonna travel while the laser is on. And you're gonna get a peppering of impacts here. But if those impacts damage the sail in such a way that it's no longer low absorptivity, and it starts to absorb that laser light, it's gonna melt the sail locally. That will absorb more laser light and maybe just in a millisecond, you'll just vaporize the whole sail. So this is something we've been working on in our group. And one of the things we're looking at is you may wanna make the sail a little bit partially transparent. In fact, if you optimize the sail for acceleration, it ends up being transparent. I can explain that. It's a little counterintuitive, but I can explain that if you want. But it could be that a little bit of the laser light passing through the sail lets it vaporize the dust grains before it hits the sail. This would begin in the solar system. So if you're sitting on the sail here at, at R equal, uh, at, at, uh, X equals zero, that's our sail. And these are dust grains coming towards you at 20% the speed of light. They, there's a good chance they're gonna get vaporized before they get to the sail. So I think of it like the old trains that you see in the old Westerns, it has the cow catcher in front of it that kind of pushes the cows out of the way. This would be the idea to be kind of clearing out a path through the dust as, as the sail is accelerating. Once the laser is off, you lose that effect and then you'd have to turn and fly edge on. And maybe you can even make a sail that can withstand getting hit and vaporized, but doesn't propagate across the sail. You have something like on a parachute, they call this a rip stop, right? If you have a little rip on a parachute, they have a way of making a parachute so that rip doesn't propagate all the way across the parachute. So we're starting to, to, to think about these ideas. Uh, but yeah, it is a concern. And the, the first paper I wrote was kind of a warning to the Breakthrough Starshot uh, Initiative. 
is we can't simulate dust grain impacts like this in the lab. So if you want to accelerate a macroscopic object, you know, particles, we have particle accelerators, we can get to 99.999% the speed of light at the Large Hadron Collider. But if we want to generate a, a, dust, a dust grain, the fastest we can get is about 100 kilometers a second using big Van de Graaff generators. And there's just no known technology to get faster than that. So that I think is probably the hardest challenge is we can't simulate this stuff in the lab. And that's a, a problem I like to, you know, kind of wave a flag and, and point to that we need smarter people to work on. Russell? Yeah, like, um, what about, can't you just discard the sale after the impulse has been transferred? Yeah, so but, you, you know, right yeah, uh, it may be useful to have this sale. Maybe you can do a bit of solar sailing when you get, you know, you can get a little bit of, uh, not enough to decelerate. Um, we had a paper at the Interstellar Symposium this summer. There's a, a German researcher, exoplanet astronomer named Rene Heller, who's looked at the, the, Proxima, uh, the, the Alpha Centauri system, right? There's three stars. And he's come up with this kind of very clever triple bank shot of billiards where you use uh, uh, solar sail breaking against Alpha Centauri A and B to get you back to Proxima. Uh, it takes about a hundred years uh, to, to do that. So it, 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 you gotta be patient to do that. But I, I think you probably wanna keep that sale, right? You, you've expended all this energy to get it up to 30% the speed of light. I think it'd be worthwhile to, to hold on to it. Um, yeah. You get rid of the sale and you've already transferred momentum to your little- Yeah, your little chip. Yeah, that, that might be worthwhile, right? But if, if you don't need the sale anymore and it gets, it gets hit and damaged, yeah. still might be worthwhile to keep it around like some, some kind of shielding or something. Um, the question for those online was about discarding the sail once you've achieved the propulsion that you need, if it has all of these me mechanical issues associated with yeah. it. Yeah, I didn't really answer the last question. The last question was about what happens when we get to the, the target solar system. Yes. Do we fly through it? Uh, you know, what if there's an asteroid belt there? Well, we now know asteroid belts aren't, aren't quite the bugaboo they thought they were in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, again, you probably want to fly, you know, kind of edge on and Again, if it takes a hit and, and, and knocks it out, that's why we're gonna launch, you know, one of these every day. So we, we get enough of them through the system that hopefully one of them gets an image back. We've got a few student questions over there. Let's take a couple from the students. Uh, Luca? Uh, you mentioned how the probe can accelerate to like 30% speed of light. What are the factors that prevent it from going any faster? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so you can you can actually understand all of this with a little bit of CJET physics, right? So. <laughs> The issue is how far can you focus the laser? And that's the Rayleigh limit. That's the same thing that astronomers, telescope makers live and die by. And the Rayleigh limit is really take the diameter of your lens that you're, in your case, you're looking through it as astronomers. In our case, we're beaming the laser out from. Multiply that by the size of your target. In our case, it's a one meter sail and divide it by the wavelength of light. So if you do that, uh, you, take, you take a 10 kilometer lens, a one meter sail divided by a, a one micron infrared laser light, you get 10 million kilometers. So that's how far you can focus the laser, okay? Uh, beyond that, the laser beam just, just diffracts outwards and you get a little bit of thrust, but it, it, it's gonna fall off pretty fast. So you wanna accelerate as hard as you can during that period, but you don't wanna melt your sail. So you're running that laser as intense as these materials that we have uh, right now, the target material would be something like Zeblan glass, which is what our fiber optic cables are made out of. Uh, and, and that has absorptivities, parts per billion, but absorbing one billionth of 100 gigawatts is still a lot of power. So the sail would actually be warm, radiating that energy back into space. So you're running right up against, you know, these kind of material limits and the focus limit of the laser. You know, if you can make the laser 100 kilometers in diameter, then you could turn down the power and, and, and accelerate up further into space, or you can keep the power the same and get going even faster. But building a laser the size of London is, you know, greater London is starting to get, you know, push the budget up. But the question for those online was about the limit of 30% for the light sale. And before we go to the next question, um, Paul messaged again that what he was asking about was actually contamination if we hit a planet in the star system. Oh yeah, here, yeah, yeah. You'd obviously want to have a lot of, you know, we already have, you know, protocols in place for our own solar system. And yeah, you'd want to be very careful not to, not to hit, uh, you know, that's not going to happen by chance. It would, that would, that would, 
uh, and you'd again have artificial intelligence that would be guiding the, the, the probe as it passes through the solar system. So Viplav and then Michael, Viplav first. I'm really curious about the uh, antimatter rocket you just mentioned. Okay. Also, given the fact that like antimatter is such an expensive material, I'm curious what the process would be on that. So the question is about the antimatter rocket. Uh, given its expense, a little bit more information about that. Right. So first of all, antimatter is is real. Uh, there was just a breakthrough made this week at, at CERN. They showed that antimatter falls, right, in gravity just as normal matter does. Uh, if you go, if you're interested about this and you go to Google and you type antimatter, you will find a set of fringy papers from, from our community, from the interstellar flight community. The word to search on is antiprotons. Okay, if you type antiprotons, you will find thousands of scientific papers mm -hmm. on this. Antiprotons are made uh, at, at Fermilab. They're made at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. They can collect these and store them for up to a year now. Uh, you can make anti-hydrogen atoms, you can make anti-helium, you can work your way up to anti-lithium. Uh, it is very, very expensive to make it right now. And there hasn't been much thought as to how you might make it cheaper because high energy physicists don't need macroscopic quantities of antimatter. They do their science with very small quantities. But there's a gentleman named Jerry Jackson who was in charge of antimatter production at Fermilab who took an early retirement and devoted himself to thinking about how we might engineer this. And he thinks it's quite feasible to custom make an accelerator that would be an antimatter factory. It would be very expensive. Again, this is on the order of the Large Hadron Collider or the International Space Station. This is billions and billions of dollars that would be able to make, you know, grams or hundreds of grams of antimatter a year. But, you know, it's an enormous energy cost to make it. Uh, but you then decelerate that, cool it down, and make anti-hydrogen ice. And then his idea is to encapsulate that in anti-lithium. Okay, and that then is stable. Uh, there's challenges how you handle that, but those are almost almost trivial compared to the production issue. So it's really a, a production issue. But when you got that, why well, do you have a nice rocket fuel? Because when you combine matter antimatter, you get you get full annihilation, and you get E equals mc squared. It's almost too good of a rocket propellant. The, the exhaust velocity comes out at 92% the speed of light as pions and mesons and so on. And you actually don't want an exhaust velocity that fast because your exhaust is going so fast, there's, it, it still has a lot of energy in it. So one thing we know from aerospace is you wanna match your exhaust velocity to your mission velocity. So if you're gonna go 30% the speed of light, we'd ideally like an exhaust velocity of about 30% as well. So Jerry Jackson's also developed a really interesting idea. This is some mornings my plan A, uh, favorite plan, is you use that antimatter not as your fuel, but to sort of catalyze uh, fission of uranium, just normal uranium, U-238. When that undergoes fission, the daughters shoot out at about 4% the speed of light. So you get barium and you know, potassium shooting out, uh, you know, heavy nuclei shooting out at 4% speed of light, they're charged and you can use a magnetic or electrostatic nozzle to shoot those backwards. So you have an exhaust velocity of about four or 5% the speed of light without a nuclear reactor with nothing. You just need to store the, the, the antimatter carefully. It'd be nice if I could get that to 10% the speed of light. But when I go to physicists and say, you know, is there any way you could get us a process that generates particles going at 10% the speed of light? The answer I get is, you know, like, what's wrong with you? The strong nuclear force isn't strong <laughs> enough for you. But that would be really nice. If anybody could come up with a way to get particles shooting at 10% the speed of light, that would be sweet. Uh, but that's a nice idea. So that's called antimatter-induced fission fragment rocket. And the key word to look up there is Gerald Jackson. You can find his talks on the Interstellar Research Group YouTube channel. And, and, and uh, those are really, really fascinating work. And it's really the antimatter factory. All the rest of this is engineering we can do in the lab with normal matter. And then you just reverse the polarity, right? Antimatter behaves like so you test it a thousand times. Can you store this, levitate it, make sure it doesn't come in contact with other matter. And we got that engineering fully developed. Then we do it with antimatter and can do it safely. Probably still should do it in space, right? So that, just that, that uh, Da Vinci Code movie really didn't help the antimatter community <laughs> a lot. Uh, but Michael. Were there any calculations done? I imagine the probe might be up to the size of a postage stamp or smaller. If it's traveling at 30% C, if it were to impact the 
a stationary body, how much energy do you release? Yeah, yeah. So it, this it, matches Paul's question as well. So Michael was asking if there's been research done on if something moving 30% the speed of light, the size of what we're sending, the energy released if it impacts something. Okay, that would be, okay, so if the, if the one gram spacecraft hits, yeah. It's something and that would be a scary number. Now that's a, a, a like a nuclear weapon going off. So let's let's not have that happen. Okay. So uh, I mean the, the 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 chances of that happening is really very small. Um, you know, you would you would uh, I think it's very very unlikely it would hit something so large that it would it would come to a complete stop. Um, so. Uh, you know, we've sent many, many spacecraft through the solar system and we've never lost one to an impact. You know, Earth orbit, low Earth orbit's getting pretty crowded and, you know, there have been collisions that, that happen there, but interplanetary and certainly interstellar space is so remote. And uh, I mean, it's statistic I often, a little number I bring up, is sometimes people say, well, what about the Oort cloud? You know, we, we have to get through the Oort cloud and the Oort cloud extends halfway to Alpha Centauri. So the whole way you're gonna be flying through the Oort cloud. So around each Oort cloud object, there is an empty volume the size of our solar system inside the orbit of Saturn. Okay, so just imagine you know, each Oort cloud object having a whole solar system of nothing around it other than gas and submicron sized dust. That's our current understanding. So it's very unlikely you're gonna you know, pass through the solar system and hit a kilometer something size in the, in the volume of solar, Saturn's orbit. Earl? Got a couple now. One, you're going to be the most unpopular. Well, this will be the most unpopular program in the universe as we shoot nuclear bombs across the universe, which will never stop moving. So when you say it's not going to hit anything, someday it will. Um, and and your your, your antimatter production is going to be the biggest NIMBY project in the world. However, when you talk about maneuvering this flying edge on or maneuvering to avoid something, how are you doing that? Yeah. Okay. So the question had two parts to it. One part for the for the online audience. The first part of the question was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was about the idea that these part these uh, probes won't actually stop. They'll keep moving past that system, so eventually they would potentially hit something. Um, and uh, tongue in cheek about the the popularity of it across the universe. But the other part of it was how the actual uh, maneuvering would happen to turn the light sail edge on and then potentially to maneuver close to it. Okay, so for the first one, uh, as I revealed in my first slide, I'm a big science fiction fan. So if you're a fan of old school science fiction, uh, Larry Niven uh, in, in, in his Ringworld books uh, mentioned something called the Kazinti lesson, which is that any interstellar propulsion technology is a weapon. Okay, any of the approaches, warp drives and wormholes and uh, 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 antimatter rockets and, and any technology that can get us to the stars can be used as a, as, a, as a relativistic kinetic energy weapon. So that kind of comes with the territory. If we ever want to go to the stars, robotic emissaries or think about sending people to the stars, it's, it's going to involve controlling highly lethal technologies. And we now know that the propulsion technologies we have today, airliners can be turned into weapons. Okay, nuclear power plants can be turned into weapons. This is a challenge, I think, to our species. Can we, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So I, I, I think as a civilization, we have to face this challenge probably a lot sooner with things like artificial intelligence and bioengineering. Uh, you know, you can, you can right now download the genome of, of Ebola and you can buy DNA sequencing machines off eBay. Okay, so if you really want to do damage, there's, there's easier ways to do it. Um, are we going to hit something unintentionally? Well, people have run the calculations. Voyager, we, we've actually sent five interstellar spacecraft already. Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons are all going interstellar. The calculations have been done. They will pass out of the galaxy before they ever come closer to a, a star than they are right now. They'll never come within... Over tens of thousands of years. Those, so those, you're going to be sending thousands of these probes. Yeah. Tens of thousands. Of these yeah. So that's a good that's a good calculation to run. You know, uh, if they're ever going to hit anything. Yeah. 
but uh, I, I, I would back of the envelope, I would estimate the chances of just randomly hitting an exoplanet is, you know, just go back to the numbers, right? Uh, an exoplanet is a, is a grain of sand in Vancouver or a Victoria Island. Let's go back to that picture. I think this is a good exercise. So an exoplanet is a little tiny bump, a little tiny grain of sand in Victoria. We're sitting here in Montreal and we're shooting off things that on that scale, I can't do the math, but it's, you know, molecules. Okay, I'm shooting molecules out. What's the chance that that molecule is gonna hit a little tiny grain of sand in Tofino? Uh, very, very unlikely, but we can, we can just get a good, after, afterwards we get out a napkin and we'll run through the, the numbers on that. The second part was the maneuverability. Yeah, so a lot of options here. So uh, solar sails have flown, just to say one neat thing, the Japanese flew a solar sail to Venus about 10 years ago called Icarus. It was uh, reflective, but it had panels on it that were LCDs and they could change the, the reflectivity of those panels to get torque on the, on the sail. Okay, so that's just a cool technology. Uh, if you have a laser on board for communication, you can also use lasers for propulsion. Okay, they're also kind of photonic thrusters. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of options there. You have a lot of time, you know, we've got years to go. So you can, you can, you can exert torques very gently and, and steer this. You know, the way we do our missions now, we use these massive chemical rockets. We're gonna send Psyche off to, to an asteroid uh, this week, you know, massive gigawatts of power in those, in those uh, rockets. Uh, but then once it's launched, little tiny cold gas thrusters are all we need for the course corrections. It's a meter per second are the kind of course corrections we need to do for the spacecraft we sent today. And remember, we're going to have smarter computers in 20 or 30 years that are artificially intelligent, and they're going to know what we're going to do. And I should mention, we already have a GPS system for our galaxy. So what's our, what's our GPS system? Close. You got... No, no, not quasar, uh, not quasars, but pulsars. So pulsars can be used for positioning here on Earth. This actually was developed pretty heavily before we had GPS. You can use pulsar timing, and you can pin down your location to within a few kilometers. This is a technology that exists now, okay? And that extends through our whole galaxy. You can position yourself within our galaxy to within kilometers using the timing of pulsars. We have a bunch more questions. Are you okay with taking some more? Sure, okay. sure, yeah. So we've got Arsani, then Howard, then Dimitro, then David. So Arsani, you first? Yeah, so if I understand correctly, we're going to have, have a large sale with a uh, uh, constant grid into the sale, and you would fire those up for three minutes, and then shut it off, and just go to the see. My question is if you centered all the electrons to the center of the sale in a, a, like a separated segment, and after the propulsion period, you would this discard the sail. Would it be more beneficial to have it that way so you have like a solution to the dust impact problem because you have less area of impact? So to follow up on the question from earlier about uh, re basically removing the sail once the propulsion is finished to try to minimize the dust impact as well as potentially the cross section of hitting other objects down the road. Okay, yeah, first of all, I mean, great question and I'm delighted you're thinking this way. We need people to think about this from a systems level approach. I don't do a lot of systems level engineering, but that's kind of what you're thinking about, which is great. Um, I mean, just thinking about it extemporaneously here. If you throw away the sail, you just keep the, the, the chip, which somebody else had suggested earlier. If that little chip still gets hit by the dust grain, it's, it's gone. So why not distribute a thousand of those chips over the surface of the sail? And that way, if one of them gets hit, we have, we have 999 redundant ones that can that can still keep functioning, but of course it's gonna weigh more. So it's a trade-off and, and that's a, a systems optimization question. But you know, this is the kind of thing we, we can start doing the engineering on this now, right? You can, you can start running those calculations and seeing where the, where the trade-off is. All right. Three quick questions. Uh, first, if you don't decelerate, how confident are you that in 20 or 30 years from now when we go, if we go this way, that uh, the cameras will be able to take uh, pictures in focus, given the level of anticipated computer technology we'll have at that time. Secondly, what percentage of hexagons can we afford to get damaged by the dust grains or something else before we lose the ability? 
to reconstitute an accurate picture? And third, for a layperson like me, how many exoplanets do we anticipate being able to launch these sails to that we could possibly see in our lifetime? So it was a three-part question. The, the, the third part was how many exoplanets to, to potentially be able to reach. The second part was in terms of the integrity of the sail, how, many, how much of it would we potentially lose before it's a problem. Remind me of the first? Camera focus. Okay. The camera we focus, yeah. Focus. Right. And how reliable is our plan to maintain the focus when we pass by? Yeah, so let's just think about New Horizons for a minute. So 2005, we launched a probe to Pluto, did a Pluto flyby in 2015, massive success. And then they started looking for another target for New Horizons, and they found one. They found a Kuiper Belt object, MU69, uh, Akoth, which we flew by, uh, I remember it was New Year's Eve 2019, uh, we, we, it flew by. This is an object we didn't even know existed when we launched the spacecraft. So it was found uh, using, using Hubble, as I recall, they found it uh, and, and were able to retarget New Horizons to find that, you know, to fly by that object at, at very high speeds, uh, you know, and very, very dark out there. Mm -hmm. And, and they get these amazing images of a Kuiper Belt object, which I, I thought in many ways was even cooler than the, than the Pluto flyby. So the first target will probably be Proxima Centauri. We know there's an exoplanet there. And astronomers are really good. They will know where the position of that exoplanet is when the probe gets there with enough precision that you know, they, can, they can program the, 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 the probe to, to, to rotate and, 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 and do the imaging. Uh, but think about where artificial intelligence is going to be in 20 or 30 years. And I, I think we're up to it. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not an expert on it, but my colleagues at UC Santa Barbara, there's a graduate student in artificial intelligence that's working with Philip Lubin's group, and they've been doing simulations on this. And it, it looks like it's, it's doable. Okay. So uh, next question is how much of the sale can be damaged? Yeah. Uh, again, that's kind of you know, getting into a systems level analysis here, uh, you know, just think about fault tolerant networks, you know, why does the internet work so well? Why, why do my tweets still go out when the power goes out and the cell phones go down? Uh, you know, I, 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 think there's, I think there's a lot of, uh, we have quite a, a lot of tools in our, in our toolkit to draw on to solve this, this problem. And then as for how many exoplanets, that's answer would be to ask, a, uh, exoplanet astronomer, but we're finding out, gosh, you know, everywhere we look, we find 600 so far. Yeah, we, 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 we find exoplanets everywhere we look. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting targets out there. There's uh, uh, Epsilon Eridani is a really attractive target. I think it's 11 light years out. Uh, Tau Ceti is, a, I think, a little bit closer, very attractive target. Right now, I think there's some controversy about whether or not those are not confirmed exoplanets, but it's, it's likely uh, there, there, there could be exoplanets there. It would be nice if there was exoplanets around Alpha Centauri A and B because they're very much like our sun. Uh, people are searching, there's been claims, retracted claims. There's a very cool uh, mission concept called on the tip of my tongue uh, to, to try and work out using astrometry I'm pronouncing that. I've never astrometry, astrometry to, to work out if there is a, a, a terrestrial sized planet around Alpha, Alpha Cin A or B. Uh, the, the planet at Proxima, you know, Proxima is a flare star, so it's probably not, if you, if you want to look for life, you know, maybe not the most promising planet, but, but who knows, who knows what other life, you know, life finds a way, right? So, uh, you know, I, I would think every exoplanet would be a target of interest. And I think the current thinking is almost almost every star has a, has an exoplanet if it's not in a in a in a so we've got uh, Demetro, then Daniel then Santiago no no i had a question so then, uh, because yeah you were thinking about sail and whether or not to drop into our research about well you think we can use it as like a single uh well chip that flies with a sail or as far as i understood one point the idea was that the whole sail is kind of Compose out of chips, and well, we'll lose some, but some remain. Um, were there any ideas of using sail as also like uh, some sort of a? I've got the word. The lens. No, so, uh, solar power. Yeah. 
solar panel. Right? Yes, for energy or to break through the system. Because we're going at 30% speed of light. It's yeah. Because oh, also you were talking about contamination and how serious is contamination was. Well, we're going to hit something 0.3 C. We, it's going to be like basically removed from existence in a flash of light. Okay. So the question is in regarding using the entire sail with some solar panel type material that could absorb light to allow for, I guess, maneuverability to prevent contamination and collisions. Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of ideas out there. I mean, you're generating some good ideas on your own. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, uh, so researcher Jeff Landis at NASA Glenn, who looks at this, it's not his day job at NASA, but he, he, he in his spare time looks at this. Um, lots of ways to generate power. You mentioned you're moving at 30% the speed of light and you're crossing magnetic field lines. So right there is a way to generate power. Just have a wire across your sail and your, your, your conductor cutting through field lines are gonna generate power. That's one way to generate power. Um, what else again? It was uh, trying to have a solar panel built in. So yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah. the sale, a lot of options out there, right? I mean, just think about how technology is advancing now and, you know, the breakthroughs being made and photovoltaics are making, there are all kinds of new photovoltaic materials. Um, I think there's a, 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 again, there's a big bag with a lot of, a lot of tools inside we can reach into. And a lot of these technology are, are, technologies are gonna be developed anyway for other applications. So like, think about the wave of technology that's coming and how we can exploit that. And it, it's a very different kind of thinking for me. Because as an aerospace engineer, the rocket engines we use today, they're not that different than what uh, we used in the 1950s. You know, the rockets that sent New Horizons to Pluto were all developed, all of them were developed in the 1950s. And you know, if, if some of Von Braun's team rose up from the dead, which is not the Nazis from the dead, not pleasant to think yeah. about, but if they were to look at a Raptor engine today, they would say, oh yeah, that's the turbo pump and that's this, that's this, there's nothing new there. So it's really uh, Philip Lubin who encouraged us to think about technologies that are gonna be writing this Moore's law like exponential development and how we can exploit those. And I think those are how we'll address the, the kind of concerns you had. What was your specific concern about the impact? Because I'm glad the impacts have come up because again, I'm waving the flag. This is something we really need to worry about. But what was your specific comment about the impact? No, no, just the general consensus I got from the speech is that the, after the three minutes when the sale is useful, useful with quotation marks, like when it's being used for acceleration, after that, it's mainly just being used as defense for the ship or the chip that's traveling. Yeah, I mean, again, Jeff uh, Landis at NASA Glenn has suggested maybe we could take the sail and curve it a bit and make it into a parabolic reflector and use that as a telescope. So we don't have to fly through the solar system. We just get nearby it and use that as an optical element to do imaging. So I would, I would hold on to the sail. Might be, might be useful. Daniel. So I had two questions. Uh, are we planning only to put cameras on the or are we planning to put any other measuring instruments on it? And if yes, which ones? And the uh, second question was, are we planning to like have communication uh, with the probe to the full flight or will it only like send us the measurement that it took? So there were two questions. The first question was asking about the instrumentation, if it would just be a camera or if it would be a camera plus other tools. And the other one was regarding uh, whether or not we would stay in constant communication throughout the path of flight. So I, I spend an awful lot of time thinking about the camera because I want to see a picture of an exoplanet. I want to see a megapixel image of an exoplanet. But the scientific community will want many, many instruments, I'm sure, right? So right now, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, they have actually switched off the cameras. They're cold. They have no way to restart them. Uh, the software has all been overwritten. Right now, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, they're doing fields and particle measurements. Right, and there's a lot of interest in launching something called the interstellar probe, not to another solar system, but that will just go further out into space. So JPLs wanted to do this since the 1970s. It used to be called the TAW mission, Thousand Astronomical Unit Mission. And they're even talking about not putting a camera on that at all and just doing fields and particle measurements to find out how much gas, how much dust, what is the magnetic field in the interstellar media. So for sure those instruments will be there um, but, but let's be honest, right? We want to see that picture of an exoplanet, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's very much like 
James Webb Space Telescope, right? You know, most of the science is being done with the spectrometers, but what are we interested in? We want to see those cool pictures. So, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. Uh, I think the communication, you know, there probably would be some data coming back. Um, you know, again, it's not the cool megapixel image that we want to see, but I'm sure it's going to be making, you know, the probe will be making measurements at the interstellar media and sending that, sending that back. And there's some cool ideas. Well, one of them I'll mention that I've learned about, they're working on for the Breakthrough Star Shot is to do encoding, uh, uh, you can encode more than a, one bit of information in one photon by doing something called timestamp encoding. And the idea is this, is you're gonna have to have a, with a very accurate clock on board the spacecraft for that to work, but you know, all of these things are nanosecond accurate now clocks anyway, because they are in communication with GPS satellites. But you can, you can send a, a single photon and time it so that when it arrives, there's like 10 possible bins in time it arrives in. And the spacecraft adjusts the time so that when the photon arrives, if it's in bin seven, you've now encoded more information in that than a single, a single bit, right? So there's very clever ways that with a single photon, you can, you can carry more than one bit of information. Yeah, I can repeat that. So the question is about the dust grain impact. Uh, could we have a net to catch the dust grains? Probably not. Uh, the tech. Okay, so the spacecraft would be like a net. Yeah, that would be a possibility. The spacecraft is this sort of spider web thing. But then, you know, those individual web elements that are particularly vulnerable, you know, they might get, get cut. Um, I thought you were asking about, could you have like a shield in front? So the way we do shielding now for orbital debris, the, the Whipple shield, which was developed by an astronomer, Fred Whipple, is you have a thin shield out in front, uh, a micrometeorite or orbital debris hits that, gets vaporized into a spray, and then that, that is easier to de def defend against than, than a, you know, a micrometeorite or a piece of orbital debris. And that I, approach may carry over. So it, it wouldn't lend itself that well, I think, to the light sail. But for a larger interstellar spacecraft, the idea of having a shield way out in front, something hits it, it's going to turn into a plasma. And then a plasma is something you can deflect electromagnetically from the spacecraft. So with the larger spacecraft, that kind of methodology, that kind of thinking might, might carry over. So before we take our last question, then we'll we'll still be able to speak to the speaker afterwards. But uh, I just want to mention that Robert Ballantyne online said that as a former producer of planetarium shows, he can't wait to see pictures as well. So the picture, the camera is definitely a plus from the astronomers and the uh, hobbyist side. So David, I'll let you ask the last question and then we'll do some thank yous. Yeah, mine's a little different. Let's say everything works out. We figure out how to build this, how to do it, just how to do it. How do you envision like if it takes Montreal billions of dollars to make six metro stations for the blue line, how do you envision, would we need an Elon Musk with hundreds of billions of dollars to make it? Or do you envision world governments getting together in the next hundred years to make it happen? How do you think this will happen for real? Okay. Yeah, the question is how, how can we make this happen? Who's gonna pay for it? Is it gonna be a certain South African uh, car maker turned aerospace engineer turned social media troll. Is it gonna be that individual or is it gonna be a world government or something? Right now, what I'm really fixated on is just trying to make this idea accepted by the public as plausible. So that's the first barrier. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke was once asked, when are we gonna build the space elevator? So he was a big advocate for this idea of building a cable to orbit that uh, would, would enable uh, inexpensive access to space. And his answer was, 50 years after everybody stops laughing. So that's the, probably the biggest message I'd like to leave you with since a lot of you people in this room do astronomy outreach, which is fantastic. Uh, if this ever comes up, okay, if anybody in one of your evening observing sessions ever asks you, do you think we could ever go to the stars? What do you think about this? You know, all I would ask, probably the most important thing you could do to advance this, this, this cause is just say, yes, there's people, work with, not, don't say yes, it's gonna happen say there's people working on, it. okay? There's, there's scientists, engineers, there's a community of people that work on this. You can go online and, 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 and find out what, what kind of work is being done on this. 
I think that's that's the first step is to just get people over the giggle factor. And there actually are some exoplanet astronomers, including Nobel Prize winning exoplanet astronomers, including the, the first exoplanet astronomer of all who said, this is ridiculous to even talk about this, wow. you know? Uh, so we got, even within the astronomy community, we have to overcome that. The next step is, you know, who's gonna pay for it? Yeah, this is gonna be billions of dollars, but you know, we spent, Think about the Large Hadron Collider. That was tens of billions of dollars to detect the Higgs boson, which I could not explain to you the significance of that. I mean, when the Higgs boson paper came out, I downloaded it from physical review letters. I got about one paragraph in and it was over my head, right? So how many people on earth can really understand and appreciate the discovery of the Higgs boson? It's what, in the thousands or tens of them, maybe it's somebody here that can explain it to us. It's very, very rare. Uh, and yet somehow that was that was funded. That was people in the world were convinced to do that. We got some ancillary benefits out of that. For example, the World Wide Web was developed at CERN because scientists needed a way, find a way to share large amounts of data. So there was public benefit from the money that was spent to develop the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, I, I think your community provides even better examples of this, uh, wherein uh, uh, you know James Webb Space Telescope is something that you know huge amount of the, the public yeah. values appreciates and if you think that same community of astronomy enthusiasts worldwide would value and appreciate getting that megapixel image of an exoplanet then uh then i think the money will come you know whether it's governments or private investors and so on I think it's too far out for me to even think about but uh it's it's kind of up, up up to people in this room to be convinced and then when when people talk about this or laugh about this say no no it's actually there's respected uh, scientists engineers that are working on this is what we need thank you let's thank our speaker <laughs>
And in the next few minutes, we're going to be setting up telescopes on the John Abbott Oval because it's a gorgeous full moon night. Saturn and Jupiter are out in full, full force. So come on out and join us on the field. And one more thing. Thank uh, you. We're bringing up, we have some uh, nifty uh, stickers also for the solar eclipse. Yes, the solar eclipse stickers are stickers, gorgeous. I forgot to bring them out. Thank you, everyone.